Ephesians chapter number 6, and uh, it is uh, one of my many flaws that I have a hard time not over-reviewing when we come out of any type of series or former message. I'm going to do my best tonight not to do that and, and just tell you, pick up the DVD, pick up the CD, and, and you can kind of hear what we talked about this morning. I, I do want to, I know you're in Ephesians chapter 6, I do want to begin myself, and I'll read it to you unless you just want to turn in James chapter number 4 and verse 7. This morning we were talking about the fact that so often in our lives we understand the Bible teaches there's a spiritual war. We understand that this battle, the lion of the tribe of Judah versus the great dragon has been going on since the very beginning. We understand that as Christians we have a role in the battle. But all too frequently, frequently, we also understand that we find ourselves unprepared when difficulties come. When trials strike like lightning, we find ourselves once again asking, God, why is this happening? What do I do? When temptations and enticements are dropped upon us, oftentimes for the 572nd time, we say, I yielded to that attitude, that temptation again. Very often we find ourselves in the midst of the battle, scrambling for a scripture verse, struggling and throwing out a two-minute little prayer, but mostly feeling despondent, being forced to flee or to cower when troubles come. We talked this morning about how to win in this spiritual battle, how to stand firm for Jesus Christ and we look to James 4, 7. I don't know that there's a better text in the Bible, and certainly our Ephesians t uh, text elaborates on what James points out in 4, 7 when he gives us really two ideas, two commands. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Powerful thought to think that this once wisest of the angels, most beautiful of the angels, most powerful of the angels who fell from his first estate would actually flee away from you, mere flesh and blood. But the Bible says it plainly, when you submit to God, when you resist the devil, that's exactly what will happen. Those two words, submit and resist. This morning we talked a lot about submit. We talked about what it means to keep your eyes on the cross, to keep your eyes on Jesus, to remember the devil cannot accuse me. He has nothing on me. He cannot bring anything before Jesus because Jesus paid my price on the cross. All my sins, past, present, and future, have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Friend, when you keep your heart on that and your eyes on that, it will make you love your Redeemer, your Savior, the one who gave you liberty like never before. And a love for Jesus Christ will do what law can never do. Law can never prompt you ultimately to be better or live better, but love has amazing powers when it's a love for Jesus Christ. All right. So we talked about submitting yourself to God, and, and tonight I want to elaborate on the second part, and that is resisting the devil. You see, you can wake up in the morning, and before your feet ever hit the floor, say, Lord Jesus, today, I am who you say I am. I am washed in the blood of the Lamb. I'm forgiven of my sins you're my great desire, you're my life, you're better than anything this world can offer. That's submission. But friend, I can promise you this, you are also going to have to have resistance. Because this devil is going to seek all along through your day, all along through your week, because he cannot accuse you any longer to God because of the blood of Jesus Christ, he is going to seek to divert you. He's going to try to steal your attention away from the Lamb. He's going to try to get you thinking that your enemy is somebody or something or some job or some problem and forgetting that your enemy is not flesh and blood but principalities and powers and wickedness and high places and the devil who leads it all. So the thing is tonight, we're going to find in Ephesians chapter 6 how to resist 
the devil. You've submitted to God, but what happens when he drops his enticements in the middle of a day? What happens when persecutions fall uh, uh, like rain around your life? How do you continue to resist? And our Ephesians chapter 6 is going to use this phrase as a synonym for resist the devil, and that is stand, 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 stand. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. That was my short review. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the methodia, the deceptions of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins, and we'll get to that here in just a minute. The repetition again and again and again of that phrase. Christian, in this battle, in the devil seeking to distract you and divert you, stand. I want you to notice, it didn't say run away. It didn't say lie down, as we mentioned this morning, in the fetal position and give up. It also didn't say try to fight the devil. It simply said, stand firm for Christ. How do you do that? Verse 14, I believe, or 13 rather, makes it plain. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor, the Greek panoplia, the panoply, the complete equipment of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. God tells us that there is a complete equipping for the Christian. There's a complete set of exactly what you need to stand against the devil's enticements and persecutions and stand firm for Jesus. Now, I've often heard people kind of speculate about why Paul goes into the armor in the way that he does. Um, verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit which is the word of God, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Um, why did Paul sort of use this metaphor? Where was he going in describing this armor of God? This ability to withstand the devil's aggressive attacks to divert us. Um, some have said, and I think it's well said, that Paul at the time of this writing was in a filthy Roman prison. He was chained most of every day to a Roman soldier. And that very probably every single day he was looking at the normal issue Roman uniform that this individual was wearing. And that creative as Paul was, he used this metaphor to kind of help us understand. I think that's an excellent description. I think it misses something, however, that Paul was drawing upon to give us this illustration. Now, I want you to hold your spot there, but I want you, if you turn quickly... Turn to Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. If you're not a fast turner, just hang with us and we'll, we'll read it to you. Isaiah 59. This is a beautiful, beautiful, powerful chapter of the Word of God. Isaiah 59. I'm going to read this quickly. Uh, and In fact, skip around a little bit. Um... Verse 2, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue has muttered perverseness. None calls for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity, they speak lies, they conceive mischief, they bring forth iniquity. Go down to 9. Therefore is judgment far from us. 
Neither does justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity for brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We're in desolate places as dead men. We roar all like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none for salvation, but it is far from us. 13. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, and judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. Truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil makes himself a prey. Before we go any further, I want you to see... God is describing in vivid terms the human condition, human depravity. You remember the whole thing we talked about this morning that the devil had set up kind of this world system where he's offering drugs to the drug addict, he's offering treats to those he considers dogs, money, power, pleasure, whatever it is, and he keeps us trapped in this thing. This is the thing that this is describing is us in our sin and depravity with absolutely no hope, but look at verse number 15. Truth faileth. He that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it. And it displeased him that there was no judgment. And God saw that there was no man. And he wondered that there was no intercessor. There's no one to save these people. Therefore, his arm, God's arm, brought salvation unto him, man. His righteousness, God's righteousness, it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and is clad with zeal as a cloak. Here's what I want you to see. This is talking about Jesus, right? Jesus Christ comes down to planet earth and he is fully submitted to God. Submit yourselves therefore to God. And all his life he resists the devil's constant temptations and trials and persecutions for him to turn aside, not live for his father, not go to Calvary. The devil constantly tries to push him off track, but he doesn't go off track. And I want you to notice before he ever comes down to earth, It says he puts on the helmet of salvation. He puts on the breastplate of righteousness. God puts some armor on. Jesus put some armor on before he ever came down to resist the devil's distractions. Isn't that beautiful, by the way? Now get this. I I don't know about you. I mean, this is kind of goofy. I love old shows like Clash of the Titans. I love the old one with like the metal owl flying around. Some of y'all don't know about that. Some of you do. I love the phrase... Um, release the Kraken. I like to just say that at various times throughout the day, especially at a buffet or something. Just release the Kraken and you're good to go. But that movie, you know, one of the things that, that, that it points out is this idea of these Roman gods, these false gods, Greek gods, passing down this armor to a human being. How much more powerful when we're talking about reality and the King of Kings and Lord of Lords says, I'll let you use my armor. I'll let you fight this devil with my armor on. I will dist all his distractions that he's going to attack your life with. Okay, let's take a look. By the way, I I don't want to be exhaustive. Um, You say, please don't. (laughs) I don't mean exhaustive to you. I mean exhaustive up here. We're not going to cover this thing with it. I mean, we could do months on this. Uh, I I just want to give you some impressions tonight of, of what this armor can be. Okay, Um, verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. This idea immediately, some have referred to as the girdle of truth, which it's hard to call it that because it feels a little unmasculine, but, but some have tried to call it a belt. It really wasn't a belt, okay? It was sort of a leather girdle, leather apron. The idea was not to, you know, the normal function of a girdle, the idea was it protected your guts. It was leather, it wrapped around you, it it protected your vital organs, it held your sword, Uh, it held every piece of armor together. And I think what one of the things uh, that, that 
Paul was certainly getting at is whenever you see the phrase loins, let, let your loins be girt about with truth, there were these synonymous words used for loins, right? Your bowels, your inward parts in the King James. It was always that place of your emotions, that place where your feelings reside. And I believe what's being said is, make sure that you put God's armor, this girdle of truth, around your emotions. Make sure the devil's suggestions, because here's the deal, y'all. If I know anything about this devil from a few years of walking with Jesus, he will constantly seek to distract you emotionally. You say, what are you talking about? Understand that the devil is not omnipresent like God. He's not everywhere all the time, all at once like God. He is limited in where he can be, but he has an entire hierarchy of devils, an entire hierarchy of demons. We don't know or fathom the number. And I want you to understand that when you know Jesus Christ, and as we talked about this morning, you're a potential threat to his kingdom, the devils are studying you. They're watching you. You say, ah, come on, preacher. Well, didn't, didn't the devil say to, jo to God, have you considered your servant Job? The implication, I have. What did Jesus say to Peter? Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. He's been watching you. He's been studying you. I read this, and, and this kind of stuff, I never take it lightly. I, I read this little poem some ancient had written. A constant watch he keeps. He eyes them night and day. He never slumbers, never sleeps, lest he should lose his prey. So here's the thing. He's had 6,000 years of he and his devils watching mankind and he's very good at it, and he knows, I believe, through study, not through omniscience, through study, what pushes your emotional buttons. He knows what makes you like lightning mad. He knows what makes you jealous. He knows what hurts your feelings. He, he, he knows what gets to you. He knows what buttons to push. And then he whispers in ears and sends someone or something to push those buttons. You say, I don't think that happens. Really? There are Christians all over the place that live by their emotions. Whatever whim is whispered to them, it leads to anger, it leads to jealousy, it leads to a rush of adrenaline that leads to some action. If the devil can directly influence your emotions, he can steer you around like he's got a bridle on your head. So what is being said here by Paul? Make sure that you wrap up the place of your emotions with truth. Don't let the devil go right in and push your buttons. Put something between him and you. Put the truth there. Filter it through truth. Is this feeling, is this anger righteous anger? Is it sinful anger? Should I be jealous here? Should, should I feel this way? Is this in, in consistency with the scripture? Is this what Jesus would do? Is this the fruit of the Spirit that the Holy Spirit would lead me to? Wrap yourself, wrap your emotions in the truth. That's what Jesus did. Look at this next one. Second part of verse 14, have your loins girt about with truth, have on the breastplate of righteousness. Here's the thing, not only does the devil seek to distract you emotionally, he seeks to distract your affections. Uh, the, the Roman soldier, once again, would have this breastplate, usually made of leather, often covered in metal. It protected you on the front, it protected your back, it covered your vital organs, once again, chiefly your heart. And how much does the scripture have to say about guarding your heart? Guard your affections. Guard what you worship. Listen, the devil absolutely loves, I believe, to try to steal your heart with idols or break your heart with pain and disillusionment and disappointments. And I believe that Jesus is saying to us, 
Do you want to know how I kept my heart from being shattered? Do you want to know how I kept my heart from being attached to all the idols that were constantly being offered to me? I put on the breastplate of righteousness. I protected my heart with the knowledge that I belong to God, that God is my righteousness, that God is my goodness. This is so much about the sermon that we, that we preached this morning. When you get saved, you are justified is the theological word. You are declared righteous by almighty God. Friend, listen, there's something that happens. I don't know how to tell you if you've never known this freedom. When you know that God has paid your sin debt and has made you perfect in the sight of God, he's made you righteous in the sight of God, it frees you not to run out and sin. It frees you to want to live for Jesus. This idol is nothing compared to the righteousness of Jesus. This pain can't compare to the pleasure of Jesus. The breastplate of righteousness. How many of you still with me say amen? Look at um, 15. Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Satan will seek constantly to distract your lifestyle. Here's what I mean. These Roman soldiers wore leather sandals. They were heavy, heavy leather that wrapped your ankles, wrapped your feet. But they would also have nails, the modern equivalent of cleats, in the bottom of their sandals. So in the middle of the battle, they didn't back up. They ground into the dirt where they couldn't be moved. How often we are very, very movable very prone to wonder, what's my life about? Why am I here? Am I here to work a job? Am I here to be successful? Am I here to please people? Am I here to pursue pleasure? Am I here for whatever? When all the while Jesus says, get the preparation of the gospel of peace on your feet, get it straight in your head, I'm here to spread the good news of Jesus. I'm here to stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he saved my soul, that he is no longer freed, or that he's freed me from the penalty of sin, but he is freeing me from the power of sin and one day from the presence of sin. I'm here for the gospel. This is where I stand. When a Christian starts standing firm in the gospel, they know who they are and why they're here. Here's another one. Above all, that's a strong statement, verse 16. Taking the shield of faith wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Um, we often have seen the Roman shield kind of depicted as like that little round shield you wore on your arm. I think uh, recent movies have gotten it a lot closer to right. The Greek word shield there actually ha carries the connotation of door. These were gigantic, like door-like shields. They were, they were basically an iron frame with thick leather stretched across it, oftentimes metal down the front. The idea was that a soldier could get his entire body and hide completely behind that shield. They would often wet those shields so if those arrows were lit and stuck in the shield that the soldier wouldn't be injured. And here's the thing. The devil wants to distract your dependence. He does not want you trusting Jesus. He wants you trusting in you. He wants you trusting in your preacher. He wants you trusting in, in, in whatever human wisdom. He wants you trusting in self-help. He wants you trusting somebody else. He wants you to put your dependence on someone or something, but please not Jesus. And here's the idea. Why is the shield of faith so very powerful? Because when the devil launches his lies and insinuations, you are putting your entire body. By the way, what do you think our shield is? Our shield is Jesus Christ. Doesn't the psalmist say it kind of like this? Blessed be the Lord my strength which teaches my hands to war, my fingers to fight, my goodness, my fortress, my high tower, my deliverer, my shield in he in whom I trust. The idea here is when the devil launches his assaults, you don't try to fight him and you don't try to fight the human instruments that are aiding him. You crouch down behind Jesus and you get Jesus between you and the devil. You, you can't even see the enemy when you're crouched behind that door. All you can see is the door. 
And I believe that idea that you go straight to Christ when you're tempted, straight to Christ when you're troubled, that you go right to him. The devil is a roaring lion, but he cannot stand up to the lion of Judah, who is our lion. You stand behind this door and find your protection. Look at this. Take the helmet of salvation. This is the most ornate piece in the Roman soldier's uh, entire uniform. Obviously, it was there to protect your entire head. And I believe Jesus who put on the helmet of salvation. The idea is this, y'all. And if you're a Christian, you know this. How prone we are to spiritual amnesia, right? We start the day with like the best of intentions and Jesus loves me and I'm here for the gospel. And by like one o'clock, we've forgotten we're even saved, you know? Like, like, like I had the best of intentions and I forgot it all by the middle of the day. This spiritual amnesia, this forgetfulness, this, the devil washing over your mind with his ideas and his concepts and things that are valuable to this culture. And we're so prone to forget. But when you have the helmet of salvation on, you are asking God to help you remember who you really are, why you're really here. Let me speed it up. Y'all look tired. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's been well said, I probably don't have to repeat it, that the sword is the only offensive weapon in the entire bunch. But I believe what is being said here is, when you are standing wrapped up in Jesus, the devil wants to hit you emotionally, but he can't. The devil wants to hit your affections, but he can't. The devil wants to change your mind, but he can't. The devil wants to get you away from Jesus, but he can't. Listen, when you know the Word of God and you live the Word of God and you go into a workplace, by the way, you don't have to walk in, nobody's going to do this, I mean, hopefully you're not, you don't have to walk into like your workplace with like your giant family Bible, like neon sign on the front, Jesus saves, you know, you don't have to do that. You simply have to be someone who walks with Christ. And ultimately, you're going to have to share the hope that's in you, and that's Jesus. Nobody's going to like just look at you and say, there's something so special about you. Jesus, ah, you know, it's not going to happen like that. You're going to have to share him at some point. You're going to have to tell people what he did for you at some point. But y'all, the thing I'm finding, this Bible has power, man. This thing has, the, you've read that verse, right? The one that says in, in 2 Corinthians 10, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We don't have physical weapons, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I'm finding when I do counseling, I want to use the Bible to do counseling. I'm finding when I preach sermons, I used to be so terribly concerned. Ask some of these guys who know about the process I've had over these last almost eight years. I was so concerned that every single word of it was right. I'd agonize for two hours so help me God over two or three sentences, making sure they were just right. I'd cross every T, I'd dot, I'd dot every I. Y'all remember I'd stand up here with, a, with an eight-page manuscript, and I'd try to let you know I wasn't reading it, but I was reading it. Right? I'm not discounting all that. That's, that's what I was. That's where I was. God used that. What I'm beginning to find out the power is not in the preacher in, in his particular presentation. You ought to do the best you can. You ought to prepare. There is power in the Word of God. That will change lives. That'll break. There's some stuff going on in our church right now. That's one thing I want to do Sunday is celebrate some of the victories, okay? There's some stuff going on in some lives right now. I'm talking about strongholds getting knocked down in marriages. I'm talking about some people who didn't believe and weren't in church are on the cusp of accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior. I'm talking about some broken little lives that are starting to get healed. I'm not saying it's thousands or hundreds or even dozens and dozens, but it is happening as the Word of God and the Spirit of God do what they do. The sword of the Spirit, when you read it, when you know it, when you live it, when you speak it, it cuts, man. Let me end this way. All right, I'd love to put on that armor. That sounds good, preacher. I'd love to put on that armor, uh, but clearly he's kind of given me a metaphor to understand I need to try harder to be these things. No, I don't think that's it at all. 
I, I don't think he said, know all the pieces of the armor. He said, put the armor on. Like, put it on. How do you put it on? I think he gives us the key in verse number 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. That means God supply this need in the spirit. Watching thereunto with all perseverance. Don't quit. And supplication, Lord, please supply the need for my brothers and sisters in Christ, all saints. I tell you what would be a good thing tomorrow morning when you first wake up is before your feet ever get off the edge of that bed and before the devil has the chance to attack you. And by the way, I've gotten away from this and tomorrow morning I want to get back to it because it makes a difference. Before I get out of bed, I want to say, God, I know that you're mine. I know, Lord Jesus, you saved my soul, and I didn't deserve it. I was wretched, but you saved me, and you've washed all my sins away in the blood, and I know there's going to be things that I do and think that are going to be wrong. Thank you that they're already forgiven. Thank you that you're that good, that you love me that much. Lord, there's nothing the world can offer that's better than you. There's nothing they can hit me with that can take me away from you. Lord, thank you for the cross. And God, this morning, before I ever get out of this bed, I want to wrap up my emotions in truth. Lord, you know how prone I am to get angry. You know how prone I am to get my feelings hurt. You know how prone I am to get offended and to carry some little grudge. You know how prone I am, Lord, to get jealous. You know all of that, so please wrap me in your truth so I can filter my feelings through what you say. God, I want to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Lord, you know how vulnerable my heart is. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Take my heart. Lord Jesus, thank you that you've made me righteous. That's better than any idol the world can offer or any pain they can threaten me with. Let me put on the breastplate of righteousness right now. Lord Jesus, Let my feet be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I want to put the gospel on. I want to live for that, Lord. Don't let me waste my life. I want to live for you. I want to live for the gospel. Lord, I want to take up the shield of faith. Jesus, I want to hide behind you today. There's some stuff coming my way. I don't even know what it's going to be, but I don't want to look at it. I want to look at you. Lord, I put on by faith the helmet of salvation. Help me not to forget who you are and who I am in you. Help me not to get spiritual amnesia. God, renew my mind. And Lord Jesus, I want to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is your word. I'm about to get off this bed and I'm going to read it. I'm going to spend some time in it. Holy Spirit, show me, illuminate your word and help me to see great and glorious things. Great God, I'm yours today. In Jesus' name, amen. You think that would change the way you live that day? You think the living God would answer your prayers? Doesn't the scripture say if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, and we know that if he hears us, we have the thing that we desired of him? Tomorrow morning, (laughs) it's funny I say tomorrow morning like we get to coast on through tonight. (laughs) Some of you are going to face things when you walk out of this auditorium. Some of you have them right here in this auditorium. Some of you may have burdens on your heart and on your mind that you can't describe, and they're with you right here in this place. Some of you may have strifes and divisions among yourselves with somebody else in this auditorium or somebody not in this auditorium, or a boss. You may have somebody, you you wake up in the morning and go to bed at night with feelings of rage and bitterness toward them. It's foolish of me to say it's going to start tomorrow morning. For some of you, it will. We are in a war. War is hard. No way to get around it. But when you submit your life to Jesus Christ and you put on the armor to resist the devil, we can be what he's called us to be. Imperfect, but saints.